girlfriend, it's Cami from the blog and channel Tidbits and Company. Today, or I'd say this last week, <laughs> I've been bitten hardcore by the baking bug and I gave in. So anyway, I have had a lot of fun in my kitchen and I've got some ideas today that I want to make and bake. First of all, I have been testing some different pumpkin pie feeling, fillings like what goes in the pie crust. I'm trying to find like a really favorite go-to filling recipe that's healthier so that basically I can eat it for breakfast guilt-free, right? <laughs> but I do wanna find a healthier version of that and I've tried a few different recipes and I feel like I've pinned down the ingredients. So I will definitely be sharing that recipe with you guys on the blog. But today I wanna to play around with pie crusts. I've always wanted to make a lard pie crust. For so many years we were told that lard is bad when in fact like the highly processed hydrogenated oils are far worse and that's usually what you find in like a store-bought pie crust. So while I'm a total proponent of buying store-bought <laughs> store pie crusts, I do wanna figure out a recipe that's just a little bit healthier and still delicious. The reason for all this is of course Thanksgiving's coming and we've actually been invited to a Friendsgiving before Thanksgiving, so I just kinda wanna narrow stuff down so that I'm not experimenting in the kitchen when those events are knocking on our doors. So. That's what I'm gonna play with today is pie crusts and finalize my favorite pie filling for a pumpkin pie. And then I thought it'd be fun to make um, our favorite wassail recipe to share with you guys and for us to enjoy today. And then I had an idea to experiment with our like go-to pumpkin muffin recipe and make it a little different since it's like such a repeat recipe in our house. I thought I'd play with it and do something different. So I'll share that with you. And then this last week, I've been making a lot of different extracts like vanilla extract, lemon extract, orange extract, almond extract, and one other one, I think. But anyway, <laughs> I will share with you guys the ones I've made, how to do it, and then be sharing it on the blog as well. So let's get cooking. I love to start my diffuser going when I have a busy day in the kitchen or if I'm winding down at, down at night and have a lot of dishes to do. But I've been obsessed lately with diffusing cassia. It's a cinnamon, but it has a sweeter note to it. I think my friend Andrea from Pine and Prospect Home told me about it. You can mix it with like orange or clove. Anyway, it just smells so delicious. So I started out on the wassail recipe. I took some shots. I'm gonna get this on the blog for you guys, but I already actually do have a wassail recipe um, on my blog that's specific for the Instant Pot, which is a really fun way to make wassail. But this time I'm doing it in my slow cooker and I discovered other ingredients that people have been putting in there. So I wanted to play around with that. This is some pineapple juice, just a splash of that. And it gives it just this really yummy tang, super big fan of that ingredient. Plus of course the orange juice, the apple juice. My husband actually just finished pressing some apples from my mom's apple tree. So we had some fresh apple cider to put in here. Lots of spices and cloves and cinnamon and all that good stuff. I also like to slice up some apples and oranges and cook it in there with it. It just gives it an even more potent flavor, really quite delicious, and it looks very beautiful. So you can definitely do this in a slow cooker. It works great. I would say you need about two hours before it's like the flavors are infused it's ready to serve but you can actually let it go all day and it just keeps the house smelling so good so i started that first thing so that for the rest of the cooking projects that i wanted to do today that would just sit and get warm and make the house smell even better The next thing I started prepping was the pumpkin pie filling. So it's really easy. You can use a can of pumpkin puree. We actually have a lot of pumpkins that we need to get cooked up and, and uh, can or freeze the puree, but I was in kind of a hurry today. So we just used what canned stuff I had, but then it requires eggs, of course. And pumpkin pie is really just kind of like a glorified pumpkin custard. <laughs> 
So in this recipe, I discovered you only need about a fourth of a cup of pure maple syrup and that sweetens it enough. And then I did about an eighth of a cup of coconut sugar. So this pumpkin pie is naturally sweetened. If you're like me and too much processed sugar makes you sick, I always try to find recipes that I can naturally sweeten and they're still delicious. And pumpkin pie filling is definitely one that you can do that with. So lots of um, spices. I put my pumpkin pie mix in here that I have on my blog plus some extra cinnamon just to give it more of that flavor. But I got that all prepped and then moved on to making these muffins that I was telling you about. So I have a pumpkin muffin recipe on my blog. It is such a go-to for us. We make it all the time. I love having a vegetable serving in my kids' breakfast and this is a good way to do it. But I wanted to play with this concept to make these a little different, kind of jazz them up if you will. But it's really easy, you just mix, mix all these dry ingredients. I like to use whole grain spelt. We have our own meal, so I'll just grain up enough to fill a canister, and then we use that for our baking projects. These muffins you can sweeten with honey. This is right from our bees, it's so delicious. Or you could use pure maple syrup or coconut sugar, whatever you wanted to use there. Again, we have a cup of pumpkin puree in here. And I don't even bother mixing the dry and the wet ingredients separately. You just kind of make a well in your dry ingredients, then put all the wet ingredients in there. Then get them all mixed up and ready to go. And so for this recipe, I thought I would try taking a little less than half of the batter and mix in some cocoa powder. So I'm basically making half of it more of a chocolate pumpkin muffin and then leaving the other half without the chocolate. So I also thought it'd be fun to make this into more of like a breakfast cake, or I guess this was gonna be lunch for us <laughs> since I was experimenting later in the day, but so I'm going to put it into a baking dish rather than muffin tins. So I did add a few chocolate chips for good measure, but I put the just pumpkin layer in the baking dish, got that all spread out, and then I get the chocolate side and add that on top of it. And because of the chocolate powder, it is a little bit thicker, so I just kind of put it in little blobs here on top of the, the rest of the muffin cake layer. And then I just used like a knife to kind of spread it out without mixing it too much into that pumpkin layer. Just tried to get it out there as evenly as possible. And then I used the knife to swirl it around just a few times to kind of create this marbling effect in the batter. And it kind of mixes the chocolate and the non-chocolate side really well. So you can also sprinkle a few chocolate chips on top. I don't think anyone's gonna complain about that, <laughs> but um, that was done and ready to go in the oven. I did love how these cooked up. They were really moist and the colors were really pretty. The marbling was really pretty. And I have to say the kids really enjoyed them. It's These muffins are so good if you just need a quick snack or of course for breakfast, they're fantastic. But we pull this recipe out whenever we need it. But we the kids were just absolutely delighted by the chocolate in there and the marbling and they were just really good especially served up with the warm wassail. The kids were thrilled. I was experimenting in the kitchen today and definitely loved it. I'm going to interrupt my own video here for just a minute because I have a really exciting announcement that I wanted to share with you. So I love vintage art, as you may know, and I know so many of you love it as well. But what I really love to do is scour the internet and the public domain and find really beautiful 
pieces. And I decided, since I enjoy this so much, that I would offer you guys a free vintage art download every single week. And I will do this via my newsletter so that I can just send it right to your inbox. So if you want a free vintage art download every single week, definitely sign up. It'll be linked in my description right to the sign up page. And then wait for my Sunday newsletter. Typically it's on Sunday, but in that newsletter I will be sharing, of course, my newest tidbits for the week as well as this vintage art download. Now you can choose to just enjoy looking at it every week, or if you find one that you really love, you can go ahead and download it, print it, enjoy it in your home, or however you would like. I'm really excited about this, and I hope you'll sign up so you don't miss this week's free vintage art printable. There are no repeats, so definitely get on my newsletter now, and I will be in touch very soon with that free art. So now I moved on to experimenting with pie crusts and I, like I mentioned, I wanted to try a lard pie and I didn't have any lard, <laughs> but I remembered I had tallow. I ordered it from Azure Standard not too long ago. We've been using it to cook some things, but I was really curious if it would work with a pie crust as well. And I feel like you could use tallow or lard, you know, either one would work great. So this first pie crust recipe, I actually used a mixture of butter and the tallow, and um, I wanted to see what kind of results that would give me. I saw a lot of recipes with just butter, a lot of recipes with just tallow or lard, and so I wanted to try that out. And for a pie crust, you're essentially just getting your salt and your flour and the fat, and then you just pulse them or chop them up in little bits and pieces inside the flour. I love this food processor in our pantry, it's so great. But anyway, once those the flour is kind of chunky, then you add water really slowly until it can kind of form a shape when you press onto it, and then you're ready to roll it out. This one, I actually feel like I didn't add quite enough water. It was close. It cooked up well and was, was really good when it cooked up, but it was a little harder to deal with because it just felt a little bit dry, but anyway, this was, <laughs> this was all an experiment, so I was learning a ton in the kitchen today. It's always fun to try multiple recipes for the same thing. It really gives you an idea of how ingredients work together. Anyway, so that was all mixed up, and with pie crusts, they definitely work better if you can refrigerate them for an hour or even more. Makes it easy if you want to do a bunch of pie crusts the day before and then just keep them in the fridge for when you're going to make up the pie crust the next day. So that one went in the fridge and then I went for the pie crust experiment number two, which was just the flour and the salt and just the tallow for this one. So no butter and I did add a little bit more water, I feel like with this one and it came together a little bit easier. It's a tricky balance because if you add too much water, it's not really gonna work out. But anyway, so this one was just the tallow and I got that all shaped up and put in the fridge as well. Okay, I was really curious about this next method. I saw some pie crust recipes using coconut oil, but here's the thing, you need a solid fat to make the pie crust like flaky and delicious. You don't want it to form into a paste when you're working with it. So here's what I ended up doing. I took the coconut oil and spread it on some parchment paper as best as I could. And then I actually put that in the freezer to get that coconut oil to go solid. Now coconut oil I feel like is the healthier option. It's got lower cholesterol um, and coconut oil just has a, a world of benefits and I feel like animal fat does as well but I do try to watch things that have high cholesterol. So in this one I added the flour, the salt, and even a tiny little splash of coconut sugar. And then I pulled that coconut oil out of the fridge and just, it was hard and solid, or sorry, the freezer. It does not take long to go really frozen. So about a half an hour, I think is all it sat in there. And then I broke it up in little chunks. And then when I processed it, I was really careful not to do too much because you didn't want to warm up that coconut oil 
and have it going like a paste. You still wanted to see those coconut oil chunks in there, which I felt like I was definitely seeing in this pie crust. So I feel like this one was working pretty good as the, as the dough was forming and I was really hopeful. I really was hoping this recipe would work, so I can't wait to tell you what we thought of it and how it turned out. Now after they had all refrigerated for a while, I decided I wanted to just bake little pieces of the crust so that I could see the difference in them when they cooked individually. So I took a little slice out of all three of the pie crusts, the one with the butter and the tallow, the one with just the tallow, and then the one where I used the coconut oil. And I just stuck those in the oven, kept a really close eye on them, and waited patiently to see how they would turn out. This was a really fun experiment. So right away I noticed the one with the butter was, it went golden brown a lot faster, which is the nature of butter. The one with just the tallow, it had like these wet spots. I think just that fat kind of makes it more moist. The one with the butter definitely felt crispier, crunchier, not quite as flaky. The one with just the tallow was very nice and flaky and had a really nice texture, I felt. And the one with the coconut oil was super moist and flaky. I really feel like it pulled apart in layers quite well, which if you like a flaky pie crust, <laughs> I think that's kind of what you're going for. So it was really fun to taste all of these, but of course I, I needed to get the opinion of others, so I brought in the kiddos to help me. This one has butter and lard. This one's just lard. This is coconut oil. So try both. This is butter and lard. It went a little dry. I like the flavor. Yeah, dry. the buttery flavor is good. Okay, try a. I need to try it. What's this one again? Just lard. Or tallow. Too mushy. I like the texture though. It's like it's flaky. flaky. No. I, don't like, I don't like the you bite in it, it's all hard. Well, remember, it's a pie crust. Oh. The flavor this one's already? my favorite so far, yeah. Don't I like it. No? The flavor's pretty good. Okay, get that flavor out of your mouth and try one of these. I get fish too much. <laughs> I don't like the flakiness. It's really flaky, huh? I really like this one. Surprise me. I thought the coconut oil wouldn't do that. Mm. I like the flavor of the coconut oil. It gives this is a bit of like sweetness. This is is it like weird to have it taste like it. coconut? Mm -mm. I love it. It's good. It's my favorite. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I'd like that one. I think it's my favorite too. High fives with coconut. It's the healthiest option too. <laughs> so then I decided to bake up a couple of the pie crust today because I needed to get one in the fridge for our friends, Friendsgiving that was happening the next day. Because with pumpkin pie, they're always best when they've been refrigerated overnight. So. I went ahead and started with the coconut oil pie crust and it was really moist. It rolled out really nice. I felt like it was it was fairly easy to work with. And um, again, if you've never made a pie, you just roll it out and then you can use the rolling pin to help you lift it up and get it inside that pie dish. And then you just gently push it in. Of course, there's that overhang and I know a lot of people cut that off and keep in mind, my friends, I am not a <laughs> pie pro here by any means, but I just have a lot of fun with it. So that overhang, I like to just tuck under, and then I can use my fingers to kind of give it that um, scalloped edging and make it all pretty. But it was fun to see this coconut oil one. It, ha it looked, after it's been in the refrigerator, like it has like brown flakes. I don't know why. I didn't use whole grain or anything, but something about that coconut oil mix. Oh, you know what? That was probably some of the coconut sugar that's showing up in there. Anyway, before you bake pumpkin pie, it's a good idea to, I think they call it blind bake it, and that's when you weight it down. Some people have pie weights for this purpose. I just use some <laughs> dry beans that we have in our pantry. But you just bake it for a little bit with the parchment paper and the weight in there and that helps it so that the edges don't kind of crawl down and go lower on the rim and then um, you can put your filling in. But anyway, now I was rolling out, this was just the lard 
or the tallow. <laughs> Sorry, I keep mixing those up. But this one was super smooth and easy to work with. You can tell that that tallow just adds this really stable fat that gives it such good shape. It's so easy to work with, quite beautiful. I have a bigger pie dish. I think I got it from Magnolia a long time ago. And I think if I'm gonna use this pie dish for a pie and I want the edging, I'm definitely going to have to one and a half this recipe. So anyway, I just shaped this one and stuck it in the fridge so that I could save it to make a quiche on another night. But anyway, so once that um, pie crust has baked a little bit and, got, and those edges have gotten a little bit crispy, then you take out the weights, poke holes in it with the fork, and then just give that bottom layer a chance to cook now without, without all of it warming up and having the whole pie crouch down. So I did that for a while. And I also prepped some tin foil. I just simply fold it over in pieces. I know there's fancier ways you can make a pie shield, but I knew that if I didn't cover those edges of the crust that it would get too brown and crispy. So I prepped those. Now here is the pie crust with the butter and the tallow. And again, I don't know if it's because I didn't add enough water, but it was really hard to shape. I do think the butter makes it a little bit harder so after I got it out of the fridge, I decided it needed to sit out for a little bit before I could work with it. And so it took me probably 10 or 20 minutes for it to soften a little bit so that I could finally work with it. But you can see how maybe a little bit of this drier crust makes it not roll out as easily, kind of makes it break apart. But at the same time, that dryness is also what gives it a little bit of that crunch and flakiness. So. I don't know. I don't know if it's a good thing to have your pie crust on the drier side, but it was fun just to feel the difference in all of these. I do have to say that this butter and tallow one, if it was the dryness or the ingredients, it was a lot easier to shape once it was in the pie dish. It really did a beautiful formation around the edge um, and just held together very nice. I thought it, I thought it resulted in a very beautiful pie crust. All right, with that coconut oil crust just about done, I blended up the pumpkin pie filling. Again, this recipe will be on my blog, so you don't need to worry about that. And then just poured it inside the pie crust. Now make sure when you make a pie like this and you have to transport it into the oven, make sure that pie dish is on like a sheet pan. It makes it so much easier to transition around the kitchen <laughs> because it can spill over quite easily. So. Here was just my makeshift pie shield as I placed some tin foil around the corners to make sure that they didn't get too golden brown. And even though it wasn't pretty, I feel like it worked pretty good. Now you'll know your pumpkin pie is done when the edges feel like they're cooked solid and the center is a little bit jiggly. <laughs> so you just have to keep an eye on it because it just cooks different, different ovens, different altitudes and all of that. But I thought it turned out quite beautiful and was really pleased with the looks. Um, I could have maybe done a better job shaping the edges, but we ate it up anyway. And I have to tell you, it was delicious. I was so happy. My husband <laughs> was trying it and he thought it was the best crust he has ever had. I think the coconut oil is my now go-to pie crust recipe. It's a little bit healthier, and I have to tell you, it is just the most delicious, flaky texture. But I do think you have to make sure you freeze that coconut oil and stick to those things that I showed you. All right, my friends, now let me share with you how I am making some extracts. I already shared my mint extract with you guys but I got a little obsessed with the idea of making a lot of different flavors of extract and thought it would be so fun, especially during the holiday season where you're just baking more or having maybe warm drinks where a little splash of a flavored extract would be really good in there. So first up, I'm making a vanilla extract and we did a vanilla extract blog post. It's already up and ready for you guys, but it's so detailed. <laughs> I've got all the details about what kind of beans and what kind of alcohol you want, but definitely check that out if you want to make if you want to make this. It's so easy. You in essence just 
get your beans, split them down the middle, <laughs> make sure that they fit your jar and that they're submerged, and then you pour in the alcohol. I like to use vodka for my ex extractions. Um, I don't know much about alcohol, but <laughs> this seems to be um, what a lot of people like to use for their extracts. So it's a little more mild flavored, but that will just sit and extract those yummy vanilla flavors. And even on my blog post, I have like a cost breakdown for you so you can see um, if it's financially worth it to make your own vanilla extract. And there's some factors for you to consider there. So if you wanna read more about that, please go to tidbitsandcompany.com and read that blog post. But this was my batch that I'd already had brewing and I prepped some jars for it. I made these really cute labels for you guys for all of my extracts. They'll be on the blog posts. You can print them out, use these labels to gift um, for the holiday season, just to label your projects, really fun. But so once it's done extracting, which takes, it can take up to six months if you want it really potent. So then you just strain it out and then put it in your bottle of choice. And it's really a good idea to use dark amber bottles. If you're keeping your vanilla extracts in a dark cupboard, I wouldn't say that's as important, but it can lose a lot of its potency if it's um, exposed to too much light. So I have a link for all of these amber bottles that I like to use if you want to look for those. But I think they make really fun gifts in these smaller two ounce dropper bottles. It's also really convenient to add your vanilla extract <laughs> to your baked goods when they're in those tiny little dropper bottles. It's really fun. But these big jars are great if you've made enough to store. Now what I ended up deciding to do here was adding those, well, first of all, the leftover vanilla <laughs> that I had after I filled up my bottles, but then adding in all those beautiful beans from my first batch. And they actually say that you can use your beans two or three times and they will get weaker each time, but they still have something left in them. So I think it's a great idea to add your old ones <laughs> to your new batch, top it off if you need to with your alcohol, but just let them keep extracting what they can. Then you can just decide when the beans look too spent to toss them at some point, but I thought I could definitely make the most of these beans because vanilla beans are expensive. So you gotta make the most of them. All right, the next extract I wanted to try was cinnamon extract. Now cinnamon sticks are way more affordable than vanilla beans, I'm sure you've noticed. So I went um, quite liberal here and filled up my jar as much as I could. And I'm just using half pint jars. I don't wanna make too much of these other flavored extracts. I just don't think we'll use them that much, whereas vanilla, we use a ton. So same process, add the cinnamon sticks to the jar, top it off with your vodka, and it's really important to put this parchment paper in between if you're using a metal lid, because that alcohol will eat down the metal and cause some corrosion and you really don't want that in your food products. But you can see how cute those labels are. My daughter actually helped me draw the graphics for all these labels so they're so fun. All right next one I wanted to do an almond extract. We use this a lot actually. So you can make almond extract a few ways actually. Some people use cherry pits and some people use peach pits. I decided to go the old school way and actually use almonds. <laughs> so you have to have raw, unroasted, unsalted, slivered almonds to make this. And I have to be honest with you, I've never tried this, but um, I read a lot about it and decided to give it a go and we'll see how it turns out. But all of these I was photographing and getting those labels ready for you guys so that you can make any of these extracts and print out the labels. I actually like to send my designs over to avery.com and have them just print them in house because it's so difficult to get labels centered just right in my printer. It always frustrates me. So it's just easier for me to send them out to get printed. Anyway, then I wanted to play with some citrus, citrus extracts. First one up is an orange one. And I found this pillar that does a really good job at just getting the orange pill and not the more bitter white pill that's just underneath it. If you just have a zester, that would totally work too, but I will link to the specific pillar if you want to look for that. I ended up using three big oranges for a half pint jar, 
and just topping it off with the vodka, adding the parchment paper, the lid, and all that good stuff. But I'm really excited to have an orange extract. I could see using this in so many things, um, especially like if you wanted to make a hot cocoa and give it a splash of orange flavor. I love orange chocolate. Um, anyway, lots of fun things you could use this for. Then of course, while I was at it, I had to try lemon extract. I ended up using four lemons to fill this half pint jar. Same thing, you just give it a little zest, get the yellow peel right off of that lemon, and then fill your jar with it. And I've been trying to think of ways that you could do this. I mean, what what is not delicious with lemon? A <laughs> lemon cookie. Um, if you wanted to mix my lavender extract and the lemon extract in any of your baked goods, I think that would be quite delicious. So really excited about that. And if you guys didn't know, I've already shared this last year how to make a lav lavender extract. So it's just the year of extracts, as you can see, <laughs> and I'm having a lot of fun with it. And hope you give it a try. If you make some of these, please let me know. I hope today's video just left you inspired to play in your kitchen and <laughs> get in there and experiment with maybe recipes you already have, try some new things, see how you can add different flavors to your food, and watch how delighted your family is <laughs> to have you play in the kitchen and um, let them taste your yummy things. Thank you so much for joining me today, my friend. I will be back very soon to share more inspiration for the keeper of the home.